are the very preparation of abundant blessing God is about to pour out on you. And these blessings are so much so that the only next thing that happens is that many other lives are blessed. Think about that. The calling that God has put in your life is for you to bless somebody else. This is huge. See, God created us. God is powerful. God is awesome. God is marvelous. He does not need you and me to do His work. He can do His work by Himself. Matter of fact, He can get His work accomplished by just thinking it or saying it. He does not need you and me. But He, in His greatest power, He, in His greatest magnificent awesomeness, decided that you and I are going to be called to lead, to serve, so that we can be a blessing to others. See, when you understand this concept, when you understand this mindset, that you, the sole purpose of your existence is for the happiness of the next person. It does not matter what struggle, what challenge, what difficulty, what trial you face because you now exist for the benefit of others. Many times we think when we're abused, when we're taken advantage of, when other people treat us like doormats, when people just disrespect us, when people don't follow, when people don't listen, when people don't hear us out, we think they're abusing the power that we have. May I introduce to you a different concept today in that the power you have is solely chosen by God for you so that you may bless others. No, I'm not talking about just leadership power. I'm not talking about just the power to lead and to be uh, in command and the power to be the one uh, giving instructions and the power to be the one telling people what to do. No, I'm talking about the power that you've been given as the eldest child of your family. I'm talking about the power that you've been given as a cousin to your cousin. I'm talking about the power that you've been given as a best friend. How do you treat the power that you have been given? Are you blessing the person? Are you blessing somebody else because of this power that you have? God wants us to reach the place where we are willing to do the right thing regardless of our personal cost. And once again, when you understand this mindset that we solely exist for the benefit, for the blessing, and for the joy of others, we do not worry about how much sacrifice we do for as long as somebody else is happy. If you don't understand this concept, I would like to bring to your attention a relationship of a young couple. When a young man is trying to impress a young woman, he will start writing on a post on, the, on, on that person's timeline and say, I will cross the ocean. I will climb the mountains. I will go to the moon and back just to be with you. We've heard this, right? You've even received it. And some of you have written it on Facebook just last night. I saw it. I was up a little bit just tracking some of your postings. I was like, interesting how they would go so much just to impress this other person. If we're willing to do that for a human being who could easily say, nope, friend zone. How much more to a God who says, all you got to do is love me because I'm already blessing you. All of a sudden, when you understand this concept of you exist for the service, the blessing, and the joy of others, you don't mind the sacrifices that you have to do. Forget crossing the oceans. Forget climbing the mountains. Forget going to the moon. You'll just do whatever you can to provide joy, blessing, and love and care to the next person. Even if this very person annoys you, even if this very person 
hurts you, even if this very person is not worthy of receiving your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. These brothers were facing the things they were facing because God was determined to get their attention. And where they meant Joseph harm, now God turned it for good. He will do the same in your life and mine. And the best thing we can do is choose God, for when we choose God, it's all good. It's all good. The second encounter is confession. When the brothers arrive back at Joseph's palace, they find him still there. No doubt Joseph was waiting to see who would show up. Would it be Benjamin by himself? Or would the rest of the brothers be with him? He is once again at a crossroad where he could go power tripping and really teach his evil brothers the lesson on how not to be evil. He really could have had the right and would have deserved to use that power to punish them. And the ones who stripped not only his coat, but the life that could have given him a good and enjoyable one as a favorite of his father was taken away from him. The ones who stripped him of his beautiful coat, the ones who sold him to the slaves, the very ones who were supposed to love him but did not care for him were now in front of him. By the way, Joseph's plan of Benjamin's sack might have been Joseph's way of protecting Benjamin. Think about that real quick. Benjamin and Joseph come from the same mother. All the other brothers came from a different mother. Talk about dysfunctional family, right? So Joseph, at this point, was still not sure if his brothers had changed. And so maybe the reason why he placed the silver cup on Benjamin's sack is so that he could protect Benjamin, so that he could take Benjamin, Benjamin away from his brothers. When, when Benjamin showed up, Joseph could have easily seen just Benjamin without the brothers. But when the brothers appear before Joseph, they, check this out, they bow down themselves to the ground before him. Let me just pause for a little bit here. Many times, we go into a situation when somebody tells us that one day you're going to be put in a position that is so humbling that is going to put you down. Maybe you've been your class president from 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and suddenly you're not even an officer in 12th grade. Or maybe you were the person who was the smartest in class, in all of the classes, all throughout the year, and suddenly somebody else is smarter than you. The tendency of human beings is that when somebody starts getting better than me, I'm going to do something to take them down so that I still end up better than that somebody. That's human. That's something that we tend to do. But through the story of Joseph, here's what we need to keep in mind. Just because you no longer hold the position of being the eldest brother, of being the brothers who know everything, there comes a time when you will need to bow down and bend your knees. When that time comes, if that time shows up, if you ever experience that situation, I want you to seek joy and be blessed in that moment for the bigger blessings are yet to come. Unless the brothers would have bowed down and bended their knees, they would not have received more blessings, not only for them, but for the rest of their family. There it is. The very dream these brothers wanted to kill Joseph for now becomes the very act Joseph could have used his power to kill them. This very act was a fulfillment of the dream back a few days ago when we talked about in Genesis 37, 5 through 11. At this point, Judah steps forward and delivers one of the most, in my opinion, profound and eloquent speeches in the Word of God. 
a careful examination of this speech reveals just how far Judah had matured. In verse 16, Judah confesses their sin. He doesn't name names, but he does confess the fact that they had sinned and that God was punishing them for their sins. He seems to believe that what they are about to face, slavery in Egypt as a direct result of their unconfessed sin, he offers himself along with all the rest of his brothers as Joseph's servants. And if you really look at this story, you will notice that none of the brothers disagreed. All of them remained on bended knees and bowed down. In verse 17, Joseph refuses Judah's offer and tells him and the rest of the brothers to go home. He also tells him that Benjamin will have to stay as his slave. And watch what verse 18 to 34 does. These verses are the heart of Judah's speech. He reminds Joseph that the only reason Benjamin had come with them was because Joseph demanded it. In verse 19 to 23, Judah then tells Joseph that Jacob will die if anything happens to his youngest son. And then verse 24 to 31, Judah offers himself in Benjamin's place. Look at this now. The very one who wanted to throw Joseph into the pit and came up with the idea of selling Joseph was now the very brother who was offering himself instead of Benjamin. This is the moment that Joseph had been waiting and working for since his brothers showed up in Egypt. He sees that they have changed. He sees that the brothers are willing to stand together as one group. They had the chance to turn their backs on Benjamin. They could have easily said, well, that's Benjamin's fault. He could go back by himself. Instead, the entire brothers accompanied Benjamin and now Judah offering himself instead of Benjamin. Verse 13, Judah stands up and puts his, fa his, his father, Benjamin, and the rest of the brothers ahead of himself. This is a major turning point in the story when Joseph hears Judah's confession and sees his love for his family in action. It is more than Joseph could now stand. Joseph breaks down before his brothers. He chooses not to power trip, but instead he uses the power to love and save his brothers, and Joseph reveals his identity to them. Today, there is a lesson here that we need to take to heart. Sin, by its nature, is a very selfish thing. When sin entered the world, it entered because Eve was selfish. She chose herself over God. In Genesis 3, 1 through 6, when sin entered the universe, it entered through the selfishness, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Every sin we commit is still rooted in selfishness, 1 John 2, 16. Our sins are all about us. When we sin, we choose ourselves over every other person and over every other thing. We're saying, I want what I want, and I do not care about what the consequences are for what I want to get what I want. Sin is very selfish. When we sin, we are choosing ourselves over God over His will, over the church, over our families, over everything but our own selfish wants, desires, and wishes alone. When our hearts are as they should be, the Lord will heal our hearts. But we need to be willing to confess our sins. In 3 John verse 4, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John was saying that his greatest joy as a preacher and as an apostle was to see the people he ministered growing and walking in the truth he had taught them. He said no to power. He said no to power over them, but they may see Jesus instead, who is the provider of the power that he had. That is the same feeling that must have gripped Joseph in his heart as he looked and saw his brother's broken hearts and heard Judah's heartfelt words. 
The brothers of Joseph had finally grown up and they were ready to make things right. As the piano plays and the singer come forward, I'm about to ask you a question, and this time I'm calling for a different kind of people to respond. Perhaps somebody here has had pride in their life for the longest time now. Perhaps somebody in this congregation has felt like they never needed God because everything was just fine. And perhaps some of you sitting here today think that you don't need God in your life because all is well. And so things keep going on. But I want you to take this opportunity right now to be like Joseph. And instead of choosing the pride, instead of you choosing that power of selfish pride, I want you to consider to give your life to Jesus. And maybe somebody here sitting today has been struggling with who to follow because lately all you've been following was the YouTube channel. Maybe lately all you've been following were those photographs that were not appropriate for you. Or maybe somebody here today has been following the power of addiction, whether it's drinking, it's smoking, or even drugs some kind of addiction that you've been following. And because of your pride and you only thought about yourself, you've been struggling in this journey. If this is you today, I want you to consider to change your choices and follow God. Today, I want you to consider to be like Joseph, where you had the tendencies, you have the availabilities, and you have the the, the capacity to power over yourself, but this time use that power to not only save yourself, but also save others and be blessed because of you. As the song sings in place, I want you to think about these things, and I'm going to call you to come forward after this song.
as the piano continues to play, I want to give you this opportunity. Perhaps you've been wanting to make your life commitment and give it to Jesus. And so with every eyes closed, every heads bowed, every eyes closed, every heads bowed, every eyes closed and heads bowed, every eyes closed and heads bowed. And the piano continues to play. I'm giving now the opportunity for you. If you want to get to know more about the God of Joseph, if you want to know more about what God has really planned for you through Bible study, if you are really been struggling and you're just seeking for guidance and direction and a path that you need to get on, and this life has just been so difficult for you, and you want to be like Joseph and utilize the power and the blessing that He has given you to follow Him, I want you to get out of your seat and walk right up here forward. I'll just give this moment two minutes. It will just be two minutes. And so if you have been struggling and you wanted to give your life to Jesus, I want you to get out of your seat right now. It's time for you to stop fighting. It's time for you to stop debating on what God is really trying to do in your life. This is now your time to come and give your life to Jesus. Come forward. I see you, my brother. Everybody's eyes closed. I mean it. I mean it. This is a moment between an individual and their God, not yours. And so please keep your eyes closed if you're not standing up to come forward. Yes, you keep your eyes closed. Yes, you, your head's bowed because this is not your moment. This is their moment with God. And because you wanted to be like Joseph, you want to give your life to Christ and you want to commit your life to Him, you are going to get out of your seat because it's stop fighting now for you. It's now giving your life to Jesus. I see you, my sisters. I see you, my brothers. Thank you for standing up and making that commitment to Jesus. And maybe you've made this commitment before, but you just never made that outside expression that you really want to give your life to Jesus. And now is your opportunity. Do not delay. You never know what tomorrow is going to be like for you. This is the one opportunity that you can express publicly and say, Jesus, I love you. And I not only love you, I'm going to do something about it because I'm going to get out of my seat and I'm going to walk forward and commit my life to you. I am giving it to you, my brother, my sister. God bless you. Thank you for standing up. The rest of you, your eyes are still closed. Your head are still bowed. This moment is between them and God, not yours. If you're about to stand up, make it your moment as well. But for those brothers and sisters who have stood up here right now, the devil is going to work hard and even harder for you. But the beauty of this is that you've made a decision and publicly are saying to the devil, I choose God. And because I choose God, it's all going to be good now. And so for the rest of you, this is my last call. Our two minutes is up. And so everybody's eyes closed, heads still bowed. This is the moment that you've been wanting to commit your life to Christ. Thank you, brother. Thank you, my sister. May God bless you. All of you that have stood up here, everybody's eyes are still closed. Until I say so, everybody's head are still bowed. But all of you who have come forward, look at me. All of you who have come forward. I want you to head over because I want to spend some time with you at that section right there. Go ahead and head over right now as everybody's eyes are still closed, as everybody's head are still bowed. I want you to head over there. I want to spend time with you. You can go right now. I want you to head over there. I want to spend some time with you. I want to pray you up. I'm going to ask the pastors to come with me, but go ahead and head over to that section right now. Go ahead. Everybody's eyes are still closed. This is their moment. This is their time with God. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's been opportunities for you 
to give the gifts that you have been given to use it for good or for bad. I ask you, those of you who remain your, bows clo your, your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I ask you to recommit your life to Jesus. Be like Joseph. Be like Joseph. And I want to pray over you right now for Father, your children who are in this room right now are making a commitment in their minds and in their hearts that they will belong to you. And I especially pray, Lord, for the group that's over at the section and the side right now because they are making that commitment to follow Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would provide for them what they're really needing. And Lord, may you bless not only them, but their families and the lives that they affect. And so as this song is finishing, Lord, I ask for a blessing on everybody so that as we go about today, we would be a blessing to others as well. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Announcement to all participants.